special report. That's fine. <laughs> Thanks, Dana. This is a Fox News alert. I'm Brett Baer. What is now tropical storm Florence is bringing fierce winds, sheets of rain, and a significant storm surge to North Carolina right now. The storm made landfall about 11 hours ago as a Category 1 hurricane. Since then, it has pounded that area. Parking there for a slow time as our shack goes down for just a bit. A slow trek south and westward this storm taking, killing at least four people so far, destroying buildings, causing major flooding, prompting hundreds of rescues, and cutting power to hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses. We have Fox team coverage tonight. Phil Hemmers in Wilmington, North Carolina, hit hard by Florence. Rick Leventhal is in Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, where the storm came ashore this morning. But we begin with Fox News meteorologist Rick Reichmuth at the Fox Weather Center in New York with where Florence is and where it's going. Good evening, Rick. Good evening, Brett. Yeah, storm has really barely budged since it came on shore around 7.15 this morning. Uh, just right there now, it's moving here, getting close to the South Carolina border. Winds down to 70 miles an hour. Those are the strongest sustained winds, gusting still to 85. Uh, but we still will see this onshore flow. Not getting that down towards Myrtle Beach offshore flow. That means that storm surge, not there. In fact, they're watching the ocean kind of be pushed away from the beach. All of that energy going toward the ocean here. Uh, and that's why we're going to continue to see what storm surge came on. Stick around. Since it came on shore, it's moved around 36 miles or so uh, since 7.15 this morning. So in 13 hours, barely moving. And so because of that, the wind direction has pretty much stayed the same. And the rainfall totals are really piling up. Take a look at this. Some radar estimates over 20 inches around the New Bern area that saw the incredible storm surge along with it around Moorhead City and then down just to the west of Wilmington and a lot more rain to be had as we move forward here. Radar picture still picking up really big rain bands on the outside of it. There's the center of it, but you go and you see these very heavy rain bands. This is very reminiscent to what we saw with Hurricane Harvey. Very far away from the center in Houston, we saw all of that rain that caused that significant flooding. These rain bands have just been pummeling the area all day long. That heavy rain going over the same area time and time again. Because of that, over the next couple of days, we still will probably see some spots, Brett, maybe about another 20 inches of rain. And by Sunday, that rain moves inland. Eventually, all that water moves towards the shore. We'll see the river's crest sometime Monday into Tuesday. We'll watch it, Rick. Thank you. Let's take you now to one of the hardest hit areas. Senior correspondent Rick Leventhal is on Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, right now. Good evening, Rick. Good evening, Brett. It hasn't gotten a whole lot better here. We're still getting whipped by winds and pelted by rains. As you can see, the main drag here is virtually deserted. And that's a good thing because it was underwater earlier today. Much of Wrightsville Beach is underwater thanks to the surge and heavy rains of Hurricane Florence, pouring the intracoastal waterway over its walls and into the streets, affecting countless homes along this four mile strip of sand. Florence weakened to a category one storm when it made landfall overnight with winds topping 90 miles per hour and gusts to 105. The storm is going to continue its violent grind across our state for days and be a major inland event as well. Florence is crawling now at about six miles per hour, weakening, but still a massive rainmaker, dumping 40 plus inches in spots, soaking already saturated land. In Wilmington, a tree fell on a house, killing a mother and her infant. The father hospitalized with injuries. Authorities are worried there will be more incidents like this. And the catastrophic flooding predictions are proving true in New Bern, where two rivers merge with the Atlantic. More than 300 rescues have already been made, and dozens more may be needed, of residents who failed to heed the mandatory evacuation order. The mayor says some were forced into their attics or on the roof because of the rising floodwaters. Strong winds and rain are still blanketing a more than 400 mile wide span and the dangerous conditions could delay some rescue teams for days. Our operations and logistics teams are on standby to surge to, into impacted areas after the exit of tropical storm force winds. Over 600,000 customers have lost power because of the storm, a number that could rise up to 3 million. Police warn residents that even if their homes weren't damaged by Florence, they're not out of danger yet. As the eye passes over, we're going to get the winds from the other direction, which is going to push a tidal surge onto the beach. As you mentioned, Brett, at least four reported deaths now connected to this storm. One of them was a guy plugging in 
his generator and we've seen that time and again the hazards get worse when the hurricane passes by and this one is no different you got up to three inches of rain falling an hour in spots you've got trees and power lines coming down roads too treacherous to drive uh, unfortunately the death toll could rise here as the trouble is not over yet Rick Leventhal live in Riceville Beach. Rick, thanks. We can show you tonight how dangerous it is to cover a storm like this. Our colleague Jeff Flock had a scary experience with some transformers exploding near him in a live shot this morning. Jeff? Whoa, Whoa you just saw maybe that flash of another transformer going. I'll tell you, that's the scary part. You know, they start in fits and starts. We were, phew, that was another one. Another colleague of ours, a host of America's Newsroom, Bill Hammer, riding out the storm tonight in Wilmington, North Carolina, just west of Wrightsville Beach. Good evening, Bill. You know, we've been through a lot of these, you and I. Um, what about this one? <laughs> Yeah, it's still wet tonight. We're going to get these bands of rain throughout the night tonight. Several hours still to come, Brett. Uh, Rick mentioned the fatalities. Four throughout the state so far reported that infant, by the way, about a mile from here, was only eight months old. That father now in the hospital, his condition is not known, but with a lot of injuries after that tree crashed into that home. The mayor here in Wilmington, he's been a great source of information. He's telling us they have received hundreds and hundreds of emergency phone calls from 911 throughout the city, throughout the county. Far too many for them to get to, but he says be patient, we'll eventually get there. These are medical emergencies. These are people trapped in their homes, trees down on the road. The big message for him at this hour tonight is to tell people if you have left Wilmington, if you have left the area, stay where you are. Give them a day or two before they can get the power lines off the roads, get the trees off the roads, because once the residents come back in here, it just makes the job doubly hard. It's very difficult for someone to leave their home and to wait it out, not knowing the condition of the residents before well before it's time to come back but he's urging people to be patient give them a little bit of time here there's a curfew it goes into night uh, in effect at 10 p.m eastern time goes to about six o'clock in the morning tomorrow and uh, maybe some of this rain and some of this wind blows out of here by then i tell you this river the cape fear river will still be high at that point uh we made an historical mark for that river today it's the highest point ever brett that surpasses matthew from two years ago in 2016 that per, uh surpasses uh her Hurricane Hazel from 1954. Think about that. Yeah. 64 years ago, and today Florence made history, Brett. Pretty amazing. Quickly, Bill, you know, Hurricane Harvey in Houston yeah. kind of slowed down too, became a tropical storm, but really caused problems a couple days in. Is there a sense that the flooding is that intense right now because of the rain and surge? You could be onto something there. I don't think we'll have a clear answer until tomorrow about midday. You know, keep in mind, it's still hard for reporters to get around and to get information, to get images with all the power lines down, the trees blocking the roads. I think it's too early to tell, but Harvey has been talked about a lot here. The storm from southeastern Texas a year ago. They also talk about Hurricane Floyd from 1999. That was a storm that came up the East Coast and parked itself over North Carolina. And as we know, the rivers, they reached a very high level at that point. I expect to see some of that tomorrow when the picture becomes a little more clear in the coming day, Brett. All right, buddy. We'll see you tomorrow at America's Newsroom, 9 a.m. Thanks, Bill. Bet. This is a Fox News alert. President Trump's former campaign chairman will not face a second trial on federal charges. Paul Manafort has agreed to cooperate with the special counsel. Now, what does that mean for President Trump? Should he be worried? Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harrods was inside the federal court today when it all went down. Good evening, Catherine. Well, good evening, Brett. Paul Manafort entered the courtroom wearing a Navy suit, a crisp white shirt, and red patterned tie. He seemed to flash a smile to the defense team and his wife. Then he pled guilty to two felonies, one for financial crimes before the 2016 election, the second for witness tampering earlier this year. As part of the plea, Manafort has a full cooperation agreement with Robert Mueller's office. Here's lead defense attorney Kevin Downing. Tough day for Mr. Manafort, but he's accepted responsibility. And uh, he wanted to make sure that his family was able to remain safe and uh, live a good life. He's accepted responsibility, and this is for conduct that dates back many years, and everybody should remember that. 
Manafort is looking at significant jail time between today's guilty plea and a conviction last month in Virginia for financial crimes. He will forfeit five properties in New York and three bank accounts. His wife and daughter will get to stay in the Virginia and Florida homes. In a statement, the president's lawyer said Manafort, who was campaign chairman for five months, has nothing to offer. Quote, once again, an investigation has concluded with the plea having nothing to do with President Trump or the Trump campaign. The reason? The president did nothing wrong. Today's guilty plea means Manafort will avoid a second trial here in Washington, D.C., and he will remain in a Virginia jail pending sentencing. Today's guilty plea really brings to an end the most high-profile prosecution so far for the special counsel, Brett. Catherine Harris, live outside the courthouse. Catherine, thank you. A little bit more with the panel on that later. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says his predecessor is actively undermining U.S. policy on Iran. It's a story we first brought you here on Special Report. A short time ago, Pompeo spoke to reporters about John Kerry's admitted dealings with Iran. Correspondent Rich Edson was there. Reports from the State Department. Unseemly, unprecedented, and inappropriate. That's Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's assessment of the man who occupied his office less than two years ago. The secretary claims former Secretary of State John Kerry and other Obama administration officials are advising European and Iranian diplomats to wait out the Trump administration to salvage the Iran nuclear deal. Secretary Moniz and Wendy Sherman, the Troika, and I am confident that they met with their Troika counterparts. I wasn't in the meeting, but I am reasonably confident that he was not there in support of U.S. policy with respect to uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran. As for whether Pompeo believes other former officials are doing the same. I won't say today, only the, to the extent that they are, the admonitions that I suggested for former Secretary Kerry would apply to them as well. Former Secretary Kerry admits to meeting with Iran's foreign minister after leaving office, though in an interview with radio host Hugh Hewitt, he denied coaching the Iranian government. Kerry negotiated the Iran nuclear deal and opposes the Trump administration's decision to withdraw the U.S. from it. I think he's lost leverage. I think he's actually put us in an isolated position. He's farmed out American foreign policy to other countries who now could have a greater impact on what happens in the Middle East than we do. Last night, President Trump tweeted, quote, John Kerry had illegal meetings with the very hostile Iranian regime, which can only serve to undercut our great work to the detriment of the American people. He told them to wait out the Trump administration. Was he registered under the Foreign Agents Registration Act? Bad. When asked if he thought Kerry's meetings were legal, Secretary Pompeo said he would leave that determination to others. A spokesperson for Secretary Kerry has just responded, saying Kerry's meetings were perfectly legal and not remotely secret. Secretary Kerry has responded himself to the president over Twitter, tweeting, quote, president should be, quote, more worried about Paul Manafort meeting with Robert Mueller than me meeting with Iran's foreign minister. Kerry says if the president wants to learn something about the Iran nuclear deal, that he should buy his new book. Brett. Rich Edson, live at the State Department. Rich, thank you. We are learning more tonight about a claim by an unidentified anonymous source of sexual assault by Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh during his high school years. Republicans say it is a political tactic by desperate Democrats. Correspondent Kevin Cork has the latest tonight from the White House. In a statement, Judge Brett Kavanaugh said flatly, I categorically and unequivocally deny this allegation, adding, I did not do this back in high school or at any time. Kavanaugh was referring to the 11th hour political hand grenade lobbed by the Senate Judiciary Committee's top Democrat, California Senator Dianne Feinstein, who reported to the FBI an allegation of potential sexual abuse involving Kavanaugh when he was a teenager back in the 1980s and attended the exclusive Georgetown Preparatory School. Sources tell Fox News that the letter obtained by Feinstein claimed that Kavanaugh held down a fellow high school student and attempted to force himself on her at one point covering her mouth with his hand. The FBI has made it clear the Bureau won't pursue the matter further unless a requesting agency asks for a follow-up. Planned Parenthood tweeted, sexual assault allegations are very serious. Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation process must not go forward. But for many women who've known Kavanaugh since high school, the allegations rang hollow, with over five dozen of them writing to the Judiciary Committee that Kavanaugh had, quote, always treated women with decency and respect. That was true when he was in high school, and it has remained true to this day. 
The fact that Kavanaugh has been forced to contend with a constant barrage of political slings and barbs hasn't escaped the watchful eye of some currently on the high court. How would you compare the process that you went through with what's going on today? The way it was, was right. The way it is, is wrong. Honorable. If we could use that word about more people who are in public life, people who actually ask the questions at confirmation hearings instead of Spartacus. Of course, that's a reference by Justice Thomas there to New Jersey's Democratic Senator Cory Booker's so-called Spartacus moment during the confirmation hearings. Uh, keep your eye on the calendar, Brett. September 20th is when the Senate Judiciary Committee is expected to give uh, Judge Kavanaugh an up or down vote, Brett. Kevin Cork, live on the North Lawn. Kevin, thank you. Up next, one of the most expensive races in the November midterms. We'll bring you there. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 5 in New York with a report that former Mayor Michael Bloomberg is making plans to run for president as a Democrat. Times of London cites an unnamed source saying Bloomberg has been having the discussion with his inner circle. The source says the reformer Republican mayor of New York, whose net worth is reportedly $52 billion, would be able to bankroll his own campaign while other Democrats have to, quote, knock themselves out. Fox 2 in San Francisco as California Governor Jerry Brown uses a high-tech battery-operated San Francisco Bay sightseeing ferry as the backdrop for approving 16 new laws intended to ease global warming. The bills aim to increase the number of zero emission vehicles and charging stations and reduce the number of heavily polluting cars and trucks in California. And this is a live look at Salt Lake City from Fox 13. Beautiful sight there. The big story there tonight, US 6 highway back open, but hundreds of people remain evacuated and other roads are still closed as a pair of wildfires burn on an estimated 35,000 acres near Spanish Fork. The Pole Creek and Bald Mountain fires have grown rapidly this week and appear to have merged into one large blaze, according to firefighters there. Much of Utah under fire weather warning still. Well, it's clear right now. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back. One person is dead and at least 25 injured from fires caused by a series of natural gas explosions near Boston. You may remember we brought you the breaking story last night on the show. In the head, the head of the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency now says firefighters responded to 60 to 80 structure fires in the three communities affected, Lawrence, North Andover, and Andover. He says about 400 people spent the night in emergency shelters. Governor Charlie Baker in Massachusetts says hundreds of natural gas technicians have been deployed throughout that area to go house to house to ensure they're now safe. Stocks were mixed today. The Dow gained nine. The S&P 500 was up one. The Nasdaq was off four. For the week, the Dow was up almost one percentage point. The S&P 500 gained about one and a fifth. The Nasdaq finished ahead one and a third. Two sources now telling Fox News President Trump has given his aides the green light to go ahead with sanctions against $200 billion worth of Chinese goods. It's not clear what the timing of the actual application of those sanctions will be. The decision comes one week after the president said he would also have tariffs prepared on another $267 billion in Chinese imports. China has threatened to retaliate. President Trump is taking fire tonight from Amazon chairman Jeff Bezos over his treatment of the media. Bezos, who also owns the Washington Post, says the president should be thankful for the press scrutiny. What the president should say is, this is right, this is good, I'm glad I'm being scrutinized, and that would be so secure and confident. But it's really dangerous to demonize the media. It's dangerous to say that they're the enemy of the people. President Trump has accused Bezos of using the Washington Post as a lobbying vehicle for Amazon. In America's election headquarters tonight, what is shaping up to be the most expensive midterm election cycle in U.S. history. The costliest of all the races might be the fight for the U.S. Senate in Texas. Correspondent Peter Ducey in Houston tonight looks at the fierce battle between incumbent Ted Cruz and Democrat Beto O'Rourke. 
Very good to meet you. This is Ted Cruz. This year, Ted Cruz knows he's a target. Look, if you're a wealthy liberal sitting in New York City or Massachusetts or San Francisco right now, and you could defeat one Republican in the country, it'd be me. The candidate challenging Cruz, Democratic Congressman Beto O'Rourke. Politico writes Texas has Beto mania. Esquire says he could be the next Obama. Vanity Fair calls him Kennedy-esque. Their favorite adjective is Kennedy-esque. They all talk about his hair and his teeth. They talk about no substance, nothing about his record. They don't talk about his being open to abolishing ICE. They don't talk about his wanting to impeach the president. O'Rourke has parlayed positive press into a $10 million fundraising advantage over Cruz, making this one of the midterm's most expensive contests. It's about the future of this country. The big things that we want to do, going from the least insured state in the country to the one that leads on universal health care. The El Paso area congressman declined to be interviewed for this story in Texas or D.C., but did hit the late night circuit this week, which led to a Cruz campaign countermeasure. Here's how scared Ted Cruz is of Beto O'Rourke. He bought ads on my show tonight to counter his interview. Cruz says the joke's on Colbert. I do think it's funny that apparently Colbert is mad that anyone buys ads on his show. President Trump's pledge to campaign here is welcomed by Cruz, who sees the president as the reason for the tight race. With the election of Donald Trump, the far left has, has lost their minds. Uh, the extreme left, they're energized. But Cruz could get caught in a trap set by Mitch McConnell, who is keeping the Senate in for October to keep Democrats off the trail. Because if those senators have to be in D.C., so does Cruz. Brett? Peter Ducey live in Houston. Peter, thanks. Up next, we will go live to the danger zone to see the devastating impact of now tropical storm Florence. the hour what is now tropical storm Florence being blamed for at least four deaths at this hour in North Carolina. The system making landfall this morning as a category one hurricane, but really just sitting in that area. We have Fox team coverage tonight from North Carolina. Leland, Leland Vedder is in Moorhead City, but we start with Steve Harrigan, who's in North Topsail Beach. Good evening, Steve. Brett, good evening. The back side of the storm just refuses to break. We're seeing very strong winds coming in right off the ocean, the rain coming in in sheets sideways. This wind is still strong enough to break off parts of the houses along the beach. There's a large staircase here next to me that used to be on that house across the street. The house next to it is losing tiles from its roof, and the house next to that has lost a lot of its so when you look down the street, actually, you see pieces of houses that were along the beach all the way down. Now, the house is structurally are for the most part sound, but we are seeing some roofs being lost here in this storm that has blown like this for the last six hours. It's very tough to move around on these streets because of the debris, because of the water. We've had about 20 inches of rain here and because of down power lines. So it's very dangerous to move around. People aren't here either. They've done an excellent job about getting the warnings out to people. Most of these houses have been boarded up. The people went away some time ago, but it's really going to be a difficult cleanup because there is some serious damage from the wind and the rain when this storm finally does move on out from this Carolina coast. Brett, back to you. Steve Harrigan, stay safe there. It's hard to believe that this storm came through early this morning. Now to Leland Vittard in Moorhead City, where he's been posting up, literally. Good evening, Leland. Oh, good evening, Brett. It's now been about 24 hours of these conditions for Hurricane Florence, now Tropical Storm Florence. We're in a bit of a lull here, and by lull, I mean that when the rain hits you in the face, it's merely uncomfortable. What is different about Florence is just how long it has stayed. If you look out across the intercoastal over towards the barrier islands, you can see now how this sea is still really rolling. What you can't see is how is the water is being pushed in like a funnel for this storm surge about a mile up it is all just crashing into the marinas 
and the coastal area of Atlantic Beach. We were over there earlier. Marinas wiped out, which means a lot of the charter fishermen and boat owners here who rely on this water to make their living will probably not only lose their house and have it damaged, but lose their ability to make a living. This is going to have long, long lasting effects across North Carolina. More than 600,000 people out of power and still because this storm is taking so long to move on, we go through multiple tide cycles. This is low tide right now in Moorhead City. This is above where things should be for high tide. We still got another few hours of storm surge to come in, Brett, so there's going to be yet another round of damage here before people can even think about starting to assess the full effects of Florence, Brett. Leland Vitter, live in Moorhead City. Leland, thank you. Just to give a perspective, Leland's about 80 miles north of where Steve Harrigan was up the coastline there in North Carolina as this storm is just slowly, slowly moving uh, south and west. The plea deal for the president's former campaign chairman, plus America's top diplomat, says former Secretary of State John Kerry undermining U.S. policy on Iran. We'll discuss all the breaking news today with the panel when we come back. Just Days, Publishers Courting Help. Tough day for Mr. Manafort, but he's accepted responsibility. And uh, he wanted to make sure that his family was able to remain safe and uh, live a good life. He's accepted responsibility. And this is for conduct that dates back many years, and everybody should remember that. I think Manafort is entirely a, a sideshow. We don't know what Paul Manafort knows, but there's no reason to believe that anything that Paul Manafort has will in any way implicate uh, the President of the United States. Interesting, Ken Starr last night on the show. Today, a plea deal officially from Paul Manafort, former campaign chairman for the Trump campaign. Uh, one count of conspiracy against the United States. Uh, we're talking about money laundering, tax fraud, uh, failing to file the Foreign Agents Registration Act, lying to the Department of Justice. One count of conspiracy to obstruction of justice, uh, that's witness tampering. Uh, he faced up to 10 years in prison on these charges in D.C., plus whatever he faced in those uh, charges in Virginia. And under the terms of this deal, this is the big part, Manafort is cooperating with special counsel Mueller's investigation. Well, the White House put out a statement. Sarah Sanders said this had absolutely nothing to do with the president or his victorious 2016 presidential campaign. It is totally unrelated. Rudy Giuliani, the president's counsel, says once again an investigation has concluded with a plea having nothing to do with President Trump or the Trump campaign. The reason the president did nothing wrong. Let's start there with the panel. Jonah Goldberg, senior editor at National Review. Leslie Marshall, syndicated talk radio host. And Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist. Okay, Molly, uh, significance, what we know, what we think we know. Well, this relates to the special counsel, so this is significant that Paul Manafort has pled guilty. That special counsel was set up ostensibly to root out collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia, and there has still been no evidence of that. One of the things uh, related here was about failure to register as a, an agent of a foreign government. So if the special counsel is interested in a failure to register for Russia that deals with the 2016 election, he should start looking at Christopher Steele, who was the British agent who was secretly hired by Hillary Clinton and the Democratic National Committee to create the Russia narrative, and that was weaponized and used by the FBI. At the same time, he was working for Russian oligarchs like Oleg Deripaska and lobbying on their behalf to the Department of Justice to the number four guy at the Department of Justice, Bruce Orr. So if this special counsel is actually interested in what it was ostensibly set up to look into, he has a long way to go at, uh, in another direction. Sometimes the president likes what Alan Dershowitz says, sometimes he doesn't. Uh, here he is today reacting to all of this. Well, of course they should be. Um, there's nothing that he can testify to that would probably lend weight to impeachment because he didn't really have close contact with President Trump while he was president, but he did have contact during the campaign. What they're looking for is self-corroborating information that can be used against Trump. Once he agrees to cooperate, he has to cooperate about everything. There's no such thing as partial cooperation. And Jonah, the question at the beginning was, should the White House be worried or the president be worried? Yeah, look, I, I think it should be a little bit. I think Sarah Sanders is absolutely right when she says the crimes that he was charged with in these cases had nothing to do with the president. The, the, the only thing, that, and I tend to agree with Ken Starr, that this may, he may, Manafort may not have anything that touches the president. The only issue is 
he had to give Manafort something that Manafort wanted for me. Uh, he had to give Mueller something for, uh, that Mueller wanted. Otherwise, Mueller wouldn't have given him a deal. Now, what that is has to be, at the very minimum, interesting. Now, whether it leads to impeachment or anything like that stuff, I dismiss Alan Dershowitz's arguments about, I'm not arguing for impeaching Donald Trump, but Alan Dershowitz has simply created a theory about impeachment, declared Donald Trump his de facto client, and then takes whatever argument that is useful to him to make it. Um, who knows what, what Manafort is offering, and who knows whether it's necessarily true, but it, it can't be nothing. Yeah. Leslie, here's the president talking to Ainsley Earhart about Paul Manafort. One of the reasons I respect Paul Manafort so much is he went through that trial. I know all about flipping for 30, 40 years. I've been watching flippers. Everything's wonderful. And then they get 10 years in jail and they, they flip on whoever the next highest one is or as high as you can go. It, it almost ought to be outlawed. It's not fair. Are you considering pardoning Paul Manafort? Uh, I have great respect for what he's done in terms of what he's gone through. I would say what he did, some of the charges mm -hmm. they threw against him, every consultant, every lobbyist in Washington probably does. At the time, obviously, Paul Manafort was suggesting he was not going to cooperate. Mm -hmm. And interesting, isn't it, that he said, you know, when you're facing 10 years, you're going to flip and you're going to flip on anybody, even the person at the top. Telling, perhaps prophetic, we don't know, because we don't know what he is going to provide. Agree 100%. Uh, there has to be something of substance. There would have been no deal cut either way. Any, any lawyer knows that. Um, but with regard to your point, this is a three-pronged responsibility that Mueller is tasked with, and one of which is the Russian meddling in our elections. And Manafort has relationships with a lot of different Russians, and that could be where he is going with this. Obviously, he has pressured and used this tactic to pressure Manafort to come to this point right now. And the big thing for Mueller is he was not in the room at the Trump Tower meeting, but Manafort was. And I think that's where he'll be able to have more information to know, quite frankly, if there was any collusion or any conspiracy, not necessarily by the president, remember, but perhaps by members of his campaign. Right. There is nothing that has been released in anything to do with Manafort that has anything to do with Russia collusion in the 2016 campaign. None of the charges in either of the trials or in either of the, the situations have had anything to do sure. with the 2016 campaign. Sure, but to their campaign. point, they wouldn't so have made a deal. It would, it would seem deal. that maybe there's something, mostly what's been happening here in this very expensive special counsel probe is an investigation of FARA violations. So it might be more reasonable to suspect that he's going to cooperate against Tony Podesta or something like that rather no, than something to do. In my well, opinion, we, not we big will, enough. None of us knows but to speculate when there has been not one scintilla of evidence, not one scintilla of anything dealing with collusion in the 2016 election seems also a reason. Here's what we can't Except speculate. for the Trump Tower meeting, which I mean, was know, evidence of collusion. But nothing compared to it. And he was in the meeting, and yeah. Mueller needs to know what's, what's happening which in the meeting, nothing, which is why which is nothing this testimony to by dossier, Manafort will be telling. Which is nothing compared to the Russia okay. dossier itself, which has yet to be investigated at all by the Mueller, Mueller probe. Okay. Uh, as we continue the, looking at all those investigations, the Secretary of State is talking about the former Secretary of State. What Secretary Kerry has done is unseemly and unprecedented. Secretary Kerry ought not to engage in that kind of behavior. It's inconsistent with what the foreign policy of the United States is as directed by this president, and it is beyond inappropriate. I think everybody in the world is sitting around talking about waiting out uh, President Trump. Secretary Pompeo, uh, pretty hot today at the State Department, saying that Secretary Kerry is undermining U.S. policy as it stands now with regards to Iran. Yeah, I I'm having a hard time parsing through all this, and it, which makes me tempted to give into my cynicism and think this was a clever ploy, ploy by Kerry to make his memoirs interesting, which I think is a really heavy lift. Um, because his office is saying that they actually briefed Pompeo about his conversations and Pompeo knew about these things. I agree with Pompeo on the surface of it that it certainly does look inappropriate, but John Kerry has been doing these kinds of inappropriate things for his entire career. When he was a senator, he would do this kind of stuff. People talk about him violating the Logan Act. And so it kind of feels like he's trying to just generate buzz for a truly unbuzzworthy book. Leslie? Well, if we're going to go with the Logan Act, it was 1836, and there was not even a conviction after the indictment. Although there and was a lot of uproar about Michael Flynn. 
Yes, there was. But was there uproar about Tom Cotton? Was there uproar about the GOP in the yeah. Senate that sent, on my side, yes, but that sent a letter saying, hey, what? In a sense, wait out the Obama administration. You can't have the hypocrisy here in a different set of rules for one president over another, for one party over another. John Kerry is a private citizen. What he has done is not a violation of the Logan Act. It is not a violation oh, of FARA. Clear. I think and, Logan Act is don't garbage. Don't know, I don't care about the Logan we, Act. And we don't even know what that conversation was about. And I haven't heard John Kerry say, that he told them to wait out. What did he say? I think everybody in the world is saying that. Yeah, all right, last word. If Mike Flynn's life was destroyed because he ostensibly uh, violated the Logan Act and that's what the Obama administration officials claimed, then they should have some tough questions to answer. Obviously, Secretary Pompeo thinks so. Next up, the Friday lightning round, the Kavanaugh allegation, storm politics, and winners and losers. Steinmart's famous 12-hour sale is here with huge store-wide savings. Get up to 50% off. Ranking member Feinstein said last night she has passed it on uh, to the uh, authorities, and uh, they have said that they have passed it on to the White House as part of a vetting of any candidate uh, uh, for a judgeship. I wouldn't make any judgment of it until I had more information. Okay, this anonymous allegation um, that there was sexual mis misconduct by Supreme Court nominee Brett, mis uh, Brett Kavanaugh when he was in high school. Uh, Judge Kavanaugh putting out a statement, I categorically and unequivocally deny this allegation. I did not do this back in high school or at any time. Uh, what about this and where it's going? It's almost difficult to discuss, it's so ridiculous, but it is also reminiscent of what has happened in this committee with Republican nominees for the Supreme Court, going back to what happened to Clarence Thomas, Judge Bork, Joe Biden, uh, you know, kind of ginned up these types of uh, commentaries against candidates, against nominees, and it is, rather than discuss someone's judicial philosophy or their judicial record or what they would be like on the court, it's this go for the jugular, attack them as a person. Okay, uh, I have a lot to say. I'm going to try and keep All it brief. Right. Lightning. Um, uh, yes, it is lightning. As the victim um, of uh, terrible sexual assault and, and rape, I, I want victims to be believed on both sides. And it angers me when somebody says a Democrat has done this, like Bill Clinton and Al Franken, and they're guilty. But when somebody says, uh, allegedly on the left, that somebody like our president um, or uh, Roy Moore or Kavanaugh has done this, they're completely innocent. And that we need, in my opinion, to believe the victims because the overwhelming majority of the time, Okay. They are telling the truth. So, ladies, wait a second. If that's the case, why doesn't mm -hmm. Senator Feinstein act on the letter she has in July? Uh, now, I'm with you on that, Brett. Because I mean, that's she's all as, about the victim. As a Democrat, she said that she was doing exactly what you wanted. She was. She said the reason she didn't put it out there was one to protect the victim, but more so that she wanted to keep the legal background of Kavanaugh the focus of this nomination <laughs> she process. She didn't ask about it. Wait, 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 wait. So I feel that Diane Feinstein did a disservice to the victim. She also did a disservice to Kavanaugh and to the process and not just to Democrats and, and, and to Republicans in this process. Right, but you have you ruled out the possibility that it's not accurate or not true? There are always people that lie, Brett. Obviously, this could be true. It could not. It, it may not be true. It should have been released in July so it could be fully investigated and everybody would have the knowledge. She redacted the name of the alleged victim before she gave it to the FBI and at the, at the 11th hour and then said to the FBI, investigate this. This was a slimy late, you know, after the buzz hit on Kavanaugh and the attempt at character assassination, if she had taken this seriously and believed the, you know, the, the victim, the alleged victim, she should have acted on it earlier. She didn't want to do that. They didn't get the senators any chance to deal with any of this stuff. And it is, and Molly's absolutely right. It is entirely consistent with the outrageous slander that has been visited on this guy um, by the Democrats in a futile desperate and desperate attempt to keep him off the court. We will continue this. It's still moving forward on track at the same dates. We have a super lightning winners and losers. Start with Jonah. Well, my winner is shirtless flag man who <laughs> defied the elements because he loves his country and he's not going to let any storm be the boss of him. My loser is the New York Times, which today, um, admittedly, they issued a correction, but they tried to do a smear job against Nikki Haley, who my wife works for, um, by making it sound like she was Scott Pruitt buying $50,000 drapes and whatnot. None of it was true. 
Uh, my winner is uh, Safiya Wazir. She escaped the Taliban at six at 27. She was running for office and she toppled an incumbent in New Hampshire. You go, girl. And uh, loser NRA for complaining about Thomas the Train having inclusion and diversity. Mm. My winner are Senate Republican candidates. There was Fox polling this week that showed a lot of them doing really well, either ahead or keeping in tight. And you've had the rather Im the implosion by Senate Democrats uh, this week with their behavior and antics in the Kavanaugh hearing. My loser is Google. You had leaked video showing that uh, that they were cartoonishly hostile to Donald Trump and his voters, and also they were willing to mess with algorithms to uh, to help out certain candidates. This is not good for them. My winner of the panel, you made it through. <laughs> Lightning. When we come back, notable quotables. Oh, oh, oh. You should.